Hi everyone, my name is Jenna. Um, you're probably waiting with bated breath for an answer, especially with the recent breaches. I'm sure that my timing is impeccable, if not coincidental. So the agenda today, I'll give you a bit of a prequel um, about my journey in cybersecurity. It's still going, obviously. The objective, intro to data security so we're all on the same page. Threat modeling mindset, two risks and an ex exploit, and then a bit of a wrap up. So the prequel. Today, I really struggled in defining what data security meant for data engineers. I didn't want to provide a shopping list extracted from Wikipedia of data set tools or give you some sort of generic list that you can do. For example, everyone knows encryption in transit, encryption at rest. That's a given rule. <laughs> so I wanted to bring on sort of my experience from the cybersecurity web cam uh, boot camp that I did for the past six months. Um, it's more about critical thinking from the attacker's perspective rather than from your perspective. And you would ask why data engineers and not the security teams? It's a valid question. Um, I think because one, you are handling the raw data unaggregated with all the PII. Naturally, you're in the thick of it. So, you know, why not handle it? Um, the other aspect is that security teams actually stretch thin. Data engineers' uh, skill set is rare, but cybersecurity skill set is also rare. And you're a lucky company if you have a security team. So I feel like security is a shared responsibility. Yes, I did steal that from the cloud responsibility model. Moving on. So about my journey. Uh, the path to becoming a paranoid individual, that has been interesting for sure. Uh, so I've been interested in cybersecurity for quite a while now, but I was kind of overwhelmed and intimidated by the technology as well as the terminology. You know, dockers, what are they? What do they do? VMs, no idea. Um, obviously, have learnt over time, as well as my role in Fivetran has probably facilitated and boosted me in terms of my confidence, understanding, you know, setting up a VM, setting a d up a database, all the basics. Um, so the objective today is to give an overview of data security, concepts of threat modeling, as well as threat modeling in action. So going through a bit of a hypothetical scenario. The other thing I wanted to point out at the same time is the Fivetran company itself has been going a bit of a sh undergoing a bit of a shift in terms of its security. So security is more than just the product. It's also our behaviors and our practices. So they have actually understood that and our head of AdSec has introduced a team champion security model. So now there are individuals across Fivetran that are interested in cybersecurity technical and non-technical who are being trained on security topics, understanding how to identify phishing, you know, phishing scams, as well as vulnerabilities, um, and leveraging that to really scrutinize our behaviors and practices in daily life, I guess. Moving on, the intro. So, I mean, everyone is probably familiar with these concepts, so I'm not gonna read them out to you. Um, but in terms of remembering them, I don't really remember definitions very well, so I like to use a story or a scenario. So one story is, for example, that a hacker has accessed a database, uh, obviously unauthorized, with PII data. Say that PII data has actually been hashed within that database, and so they can't make sense of what it is and they can't dehash it because it's one way. Great, are we safe? Nope. What they decide to do is they load ransomware. And instead they have decided that, or some, in some sort of way in their investigation, they have um, assumed that this data is critical to business operations. So with ransomware, you have 1,000 Bitcoin ransom being demanded and you don't get a decryption key unless you're obviously given that over. So did data governance actually prevent that? No. That's the point of data security. And that's how I like to sort of convey that. <laughs> More definitions. Sorry, this is not a dictionary. Uh, vulnerabilities, so just to point out at a high level, vulnerabilities are not actually malicious. 
This is making the application do something it is not intended or expected to do. It might be an error of the programmer or they just can't account for the entire scenario of what the language can do. I'm sure ThoughtWorks found that out when they did that particular bot uh, use case. Um, something else to explore is that exploit is the actual taking advantage of that vulnerability and the malicious part is the action or activity is against the law. Cybersecurity stats. No, this was introduced more for, I guess, fear mongering from my aspect. Uh, I did not see the new breaches coming my way before this speech, but that has worked in my favor. One thing I want to do highlight is humans are abysmal at security. Right. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's not all you. Um, so I am all for Zainab when she said automation was the key. Automating, automating, automating is the key in terms of redu reducing that human error. The other thing that was quite shocking to me was the number of steps it actually took for a non-error breach to occur from a sample of 258 breaches. This was across the globe for, from a specific Verizon report for 2022. Surely we can do better than that. I mean, you can question what does a step, con like what does it contain? Um, I, ha I don't have an answer for that actually. Um, I'm also curious, but it's still quite a few number of steps compared to what it should be in terms of our data security. So I wanted to take a bit of a detour and help sort of facilitate that understanding of the hacking mindset. First of all, targeted and opportunistic attacks. They are slightly different in the way they work. Opportunistic, for example, thief walks up to the house, checks if the doorknob is actually locked. If it's locked, walks away, tries again to another house. If it's unlocked, gets in. Simple concept. In terms of cybersecurity, it may be that an ex-employee still has those credentials and they can still actually use them and it works, which is horrible. Um, targeted obviously requires a little bit more recon. So they've done investigation. That could be a simple, you know, going through the website, see who works there, see what tech they use from all of your job descriptions. So those LinkedIn ads that contain, or your tech stack, because you want that specific unicorn engineer, they are looking at those ads and seeing, oh, these guys use AWS. Oh, they've got a Postgres database somewhere. So <laughs> plenty of information for them to look up. Um, so I want you to step in the shoes of the attacker right now. So instead of thinking, who is attacking me? What would they be interested in? You would think the opposite. What would I attack? What would I be interested in when you're looking at your own architecture, when you're looking at your own pipelines? So one thing is company growth. If you have some sort of startup that has this billion dollar valuation and is heavily marketing its, you know, that series B funding that you just got, you are cashed up and these guys are, uh, focused, I guess, on shipping features, shipping products, hiring. They're not focused on security. That's a cost center. Um, also looking at previous breaches. So there's a website called breach2.2 where it contains a number of databases and credentials that you can leverage. Um, and also a showdown database. So a lot of opportunistic attacks actually come up from showdown database because you can literally look up any devices that are online that have an open port. And that's where usually attack starts. Port scanning. So IP and port scanning, they're looking for open ports, attached services. Simple NMAC command can actually bring up the versions as well. Then all they have to do is actually look up the CVEs that you've got in the database. And once they've got the CVEs, they can try and exploit and see if they can do the remote code execution. I wrote seasonality, which is kind of a bit of a weird one, but if you think about it, it makes sense. So people go away on Christmas, right? You're not, you're going to be off guard. You're going to be switched off. You know, you want to spend time with your families. Um, so seasonality might kick in the sense that attackers are most likely to attack at that point in time because people are away or they're switched off or off their guard. 
coming onto Thrive Modeling. So this is more than just a framework, it's a mindset. Um, as I mentioned before, security is spread thin. They can have the best intrusion detection tools. They can have their extensive logging set up. They can have their alerts. But if you have someone on the other end doing bad practices, storing credentials in Git, storing your secrets, API tokens, storing credentials unencrypted, you know, it's all counterproductive, really. So, threat modeling for data engineers, it might not be a usual practice for you. It might be something that you want to think about incorporating into your practices as part of maybe your every second sprint or every third sprint if you're using Agile. So where would you even begin looking at this? These are, I guess, the stack that data engineers could touch. So you might touch maybe the first third or the entire pipeline all the way through. Considering all that, it could be quite overwhelming looking at that and say, actually, this is too hard basket. I'm going to leave it. It's fine. We'll be fine. Uh, nope. <laughs> the, I, I guess, advice that I have read and would give is that start from your next project, start from your next feature. That is probably the best place to start. And then moving forward, I'd imagine that all your projects moving forward and all your features moving forward, you would have developed a database or I guess a library of common issues, common problems, and reusable mitigation strategies. So then looking back at your backlog, they probably cover the same sort of pipelines and you probably have already 85% coverage at that point in time. Of course, you have edge cases, but that's okay. You can look at those and address those incrementally over time. Five steps, pretty much five steps of threat modeling. I've simplified it. So what do we want to accomplish? What are we building? What can go wrong? What are we going to do about it? A review, did we, good a job? Did we do a good job? In my scenario, I'm looking at what are we building, what can go wrong, and what are we going to do about it, just because we've only got 15 minutes to go through this. <laughs> so there are many, many frameworks under threat meddling itself. You can really go in depth and ac academic, if anything. One of them is Stride, which is a more mature model that was developed by Microsoft developers a while ago. Um, a few odd named ones, such as Pastor and Dread and Vast, which focus on or do different things. But for the sake of time and simplicity, I want to make this accessible to everyone. So I'm just going to focus on the five questions in that scenario. You can, I guess, work with your security teams and consult with them and understand what is probably the best framework that you can leverage um, or the most efficient um, in terms of making sure that you have set up a secure pipeline two risks and exploit. So wherever there is code, there is a way. And that's what I feel is uh, pretty much correct. Um, I've set up a scenario. So for example, that engineer one is tasked to build some sort of custom pipeline using the API. Data engineer two will build out a machine learning model with scikit-learn, uh, etc. So you have to think about what do these activities evolve? What would you attack? assume that Murphy's Law will kick into gear. So risk matrix, I mean, based on that scenario, I've picked three vulnerabilities. So credentials in code, stolen credentials, number one. That happens quite a bit. Dependencies, importing packages, packages that you're not fully aware of, packages that you haven't really looked into. And, you know, log4j was a big one. Then there's a pickle vulnerability as part of data models. Not everyone talks a lot about data models being malicious or having containing malicious code even. And that might be for a reason because you wouldn't see it out in the wild, I guess, frequently. Um, but doesn't mean that it won't happen and it's not there or have really high risk or consequential risks. What can go wrong? So nothing fancy. Everyone knows it takes one git commit and a little bit of pressure. Say you're an engineer, you want to, you know, you have this deadline you're working towards, you're under a bit of pressure, that business stakeholder is tapping you on the shoulder, when's it ready? You forget that you've got 
like test credentials sitting in that repo or going to be pushed to that repo. It happens. New engineer. So there's a junior engineer, they're not exactly you know, up on the security practices. They want to impress you, but really they're just building to make things, make shit work. Or hopefully not, no established practices. And why you may ask if it's not a public repo, why is this a problem? Well, <laughs> it's still a problem because if there is a breach from some other team in your company, which happens, people do stupid things, you can't prevent that, at least you won't have a git your credentials sitting in the repo. Um, but if there are, obviously the breach will cause a bit of a panic attack considering that you've just given away all the credentials to your uh, very sensitive data. So I see subject security really much as a game of unforced errors, pretty much like tennis. What are we going to do about it? Implement some sort of credential storage procedures. Yes, that's very generic measure, but that's going to really depend on what tool you're using. So I felt like I couldn't really specify one. Secret stores is one that can be specified, but it's considered expensive. Another thing is that if procedures fail, and they will, they usually will, there are tools to, that exist to actually help find credentials within your GitHub repo or code. For example, GitHub Secret Scanner, and I'm sure there are a bunch of other tools that do the same thing. And integrate these checks into your CI CD pipeline, as well as inducting your new engineers. As mentioned before, you've got some sort of junior engineer or a new engineer not up on the practices. You want to make sure that they are informed when they are actually building. The meme on the right is not recommended. What else can go wrong? Dependencies. So everyone loves open source, it's great. It really helps the company evolve so they, don't have, they can just focus on building that app. They don't have to actually focus on building additional capability. So there are more than 150 vulnerabilities found in over 40% of packages in PyPy, which can be concerning. Um, and there are obviously open source, uh, I guess, components that can be considered malicious where hackers actually do implement typo squatting, which means that they spell something as similar as something that's very popular as a package. So one day, I was searching for pandas, or import pandas into my local environment. I found something called brew, brew panda. I thought, that must be it. Nope. <laughs> I read the description. Luckily, the description told me something else. Um, so whilst that was not malicious, I can see that definitely happening. And on the right there, I've got some few mitigation strategies that I've listed out, including using a safety dependency checker for specifically for Python, open web application source project dependency checker. You know, it's built and maintained by the community, so they definitely know the nuances of security. And finally, the machine learning model. So there is, where there is code, there is a way. Um, in that snippet there, there is a function called reduce, which can actually execute arbitrary code. And if someone decides to amend and upload a model with this particular command that sets up and creates a reverse shell connection with the attacker IP based on port 444, the attacker has or is listening on port 44 for your connection. And pretty much they have a shell and access to your system. Avoid pickle data. <laughs> um, that is simple. But obviously, you know, if there is, if it's considered that it's low risk, or in the sense that you don't use man machine learning models often, that you might not even have a mitigation strategy. You might just say, we accept the risk, we acknowledge it, we will continue to use it for this purpose only. And at the end, you have some sort of, I guess, repository of practices you know, of practices, um, as well as, I guess, how this could be implemented in a specific program. And this is just a diagram of what that would look like. So for the wrap up, there are probably three or four points that I want you to remember. Security is a shared responsibility. Threat modeling is a proactive form of defense. Not all risks have to be fixed. It's not feasible. And automation is key, which is the last one. Thank you.